Jeremy, I forgot to ask you, what about harvesting the fish? What does that take? Well, um, it actually kind of takes jumping in there uh, to get them. You, <laughs> the water's really dark, and, and yeah, Nile tilapia are really dark colored. They're really hard to see. So we have to check their weight and monitor their health. So the only way to, to check that out is to actually jump in there and get them. Should I go get some? Sure. Should we take a look? Sure. All right. There we go. Oh. Oh, that's it's nice. Not, that does feel nice. The it's air temperature in here is about 95 degrees, and, and the water temperature is about 84, so it feels actually very refreshing. They like to hide back here in the corner. Remember, there's 500 tilapia in here. They are really fast fish. Somebody has to be around somewhere. <laughs> so there's here's, here's yeah. what I got. You know what these are? These are actually goldfish. Uh -huh. These are young carp that uh, just kind of actually showed up in the system when we brought in some pond plants. Wow. Their eggs were living on the pond plants. Wow. So they're really easy to catch. <laughs> it's the tilapia that are hard. All right, come on, you guys. I know you're back there. Yeah, there, there we go. go. So let me see here. Got, got one for you. Here, buddy. There you have yeah. Nile tilapia. That's probably about a quarter of a pound right now. Go, buddy. How big will they get? They'll get to be about a pound and a half. Okay. This is peak moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. I'm in this steamy, hot, greenhouse-like building with Jeremy Roth, who is the coordinator of the aquaculture project at Apovecho. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. What is the project? Well, the Aquaculture Project essentially is, um, is a recirculating system that uses the same water to raise fish, vegetables, and pond plants. Now, basically, it, it's very simple that the fish live in these tanks down here. Um, there's two 610-gallon tanks, and the water is pumped from the tanks, and it's full of rich nutrients from the fish waste. Okay. And um, it's pumped up into a barrel over there where the solids can settle out. Then it flows into this trough system, which we have fully stocked with pond plants, all sorts of native and invasive species of pond plants, which are basically taking the nutrients out of the water. They're taking all that fish waste, the nitrates, the ammonia, uh -huh. the nitrites, and it, they're converting it into green growth. For themselves? For plant the growth. plant growth, yeah. The, okay. the plants are converting it and using it themselves. All right. And then the water has to travel all the way around As through this the, trough the system. The peripheral. Yeah, it's about, it's about 200 linear feet of trough wow. before wow. it gets back here and drops down through gravity into the tanks. How does it drop down? There's, uh, there's some returns right there. You can see that the water just drops down through yeah, return yeah. pipes yeah. into the tanks. And so by the time the waters come all the way back through this system, all of those nitrites, nitrates, and ammonia have been removed from the water and returned to the tanks clean for the fish. So you have an entirely closed system. It's an entirely closed loop. Uh, it pumps the entire water's exchange from the tanks to the tables about once an hour. Wow. So how do you keep all of that in balance? I mean, the right number of fish to the right amount of plant life, all that. It's all a big experiment, um, ah, actually. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> and, uh, and there's some sort of rules of thumb. One fish per gallon is kind of the maximum density. Okay. So 610 gallons per tank, that's you know about 1,200 gallons. So we could, at maximum density, have about 1,200 fish growing in this system, which would wow. mean every single square inch of water in the tables would be stocked with plants to handle that load of, of nutrients. Which you're not pushing at this point. You're just still trying to, to, to see. This is our first year running this system, oh, really? so it's, it's okay. sort of an experimental year. I've got this tank stocked with 500 Nile tilapia, um, and this other tank here just has some goldfish in okay. it. Okay. Uh, and, okay. Uh, and, uh, and so we're sort of running the system at half capacity this first year just to see how it works and learn from it. 
this is a dumb question, but you, I see the water coming out on the top trough, and that's where we see all the, all the um, green algae and... Yeah, this is duckweed, uh -huh. um, and then this is a plant called frogbit. They're all like in a native pond. They'd be very invasive. They would quickly spread and take over the entire pond. But in this, in this system, invasive species are actually good because you want it to grow really fast. Because the thing about all this plant material here, all this plant material is food for the fish. Tilapia can take a mostly vegetarian diet. So oh. all of the food that's growing in the system can be fed back to the fish. And, and so make, how do you get it back to them? Just actually. like this. OK. <laughs> there all <we> right. Go. <laughs> and there they are. I see the water roiling. They aren't. They aren't, they aren't waiting any time to No, yeah, throw some in there. To go for it. Yeah. So part of that task then is bringing, is, 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 I see this green on the top. Mm -hmm. Down below, mm -hmm. you've got down here, what? Much, much cleaner water. Yeah, well, the, the, What's this for? All of the plants are stopped with a dam over there oh. because I don't want any plant matter in this return area because I don't want to clog the return pipes. Because if we were to clog the return pipes, then we could have a serious oh. problem on our hands and all the water could be pumped out of the tanks and overflow here. And, and we'd have unhappy fish and we everybody would. else. We too. would. I put in a safety sort of consideration in that the inlets for the, um, in the tanks are only about halfway down. So if, if that were to happen, you could only pump about half of the water out and of the tank so you wouldn't kill all the fish. Okay. I'm glad I to mean, hear that. The, That's assuring. In right designing there. a system like this, I spent a lot of time researching other systems. And, and what I got from most of what other people were doing is keep it really simple. Mm -hmm. Um, fewer moving parts, the better, and make sure that if it breaks, then there's some sort of failsafe because inevitably it will break. Don't you wish that we had that kind of design in the rest of industrial civilization? Absolutely. But that's another topic. <laughs> that's another show. So this water is coming back into into our the tanks yep. for the fish. Yep. And another another part of having the water in these troughs, in, in they're they're about they're about that deep, so about oh, six so inches deep. Yeah is that we need to get as much surface area exposed to sunlight as possible because we want the water to be about 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh. If you feel the water, oh, yeah, you yeah, actually see yeah. right here um, that right in the tank, it's 84 degrees yeah. Fahrenheit right yeah, now. Yeah, it's a nice temperature. Tilapia are a, uh, they're a tropical cichlid, so 82 is pretty much where they like it. They'll actually die below 55 degrees. So okay. here in the temperate northwest, this type of project is only uh, can only operate during the spring, summer, and fall, unless you're artificially heating the water. And so that means then, are you, you'll do your tilapia harvest fall? We'll, we'll harvest the tilapia probably in October. It's gonna be weather okay. dependent, okay. sort of. Okay. As soon as it starts to seem like it's gonna get cold and the water's gonna slope down below their tolerance, then we'll harvest them. Okay. What are, what are all the, I mean, it looks like a little greenhouse over here. Yep. What's this? So, so the thing about a recirculating system is it can be designed in a number of different ways. Um, and for our system, we are mostly interested in having fish, as much fish ah. as possible, because, ah. you know, we've got this beautiful acre organic vegetable garden here at Aprovecho. Um, we've got plenty of room to grow vegetables, but we don't have a lot of place to grow fish. So our system is designed mostly favoring fish and food for the fish. But what we did set up here in the, in the center is a hydroponic vegetable growing bed. Um, huh. And hydroponics is, is simply just growing vegetables in a soilless meeting, medium. Oh, I see. You've got, you've got some what, gravel. It's just pea gravel. Yeah. It's and, the same stuff that we're standing on. Um, and what happens is part of the water from the fish tanks is diverted into this gravel bed. We wanted to include a, a vegetable component to the whole system because we wanted to sort of see what can be done with hydroponics. Um, and hydroponics have, is, is simply just growing plants in a soilless medium, like right here. This is just pea gravel. Okay. Uh, it's yeah. the same stuff on the ground here in the greenhouse. And the water is diverted, part of the water is diverted from the fish tanks into this gravel bar. And the water just flows from one end to the other. And the water, once again, is rich yeah. with all those fish nutrients. And the plants just root into the gravel and take up all their nutrients from the from the liquid. From so the do you do you I mean like this tomato plant, you 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 dig down some to get it sort of started? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I mean if then, you can feel the bottom is just right here. I mean that's shallow. That's yeah, only that's There's only, only about two or three yeah. inches of gravel in here. 
and you can see that there's just you a whole. Some charred and yep. okay. We got charred and tomatoes. Um, there's uh, some cucumbers and broccoli and uh, tomatillos. So things that that can that are there certain plants that do better with sort of shallow roots like this? There are, there are, um, and we're once again sort of it's a big experiment. Some plants are showing that they can't really grow to maturity in shallow rooted wet water. Some plants, like tomatoes, seem to be doing fine no matter what. Um, the cucumbers are doing really great in here. Yep. Well, it'll be really interesting to come back in about five years and see where this has evolved. What, on the other side, I noticed that from the far side of your, you know, through the pond scum, on the far side of that river, there's some other wilder looking plants. What's, what's over there? Yeah, let's go over there and take a look. In order to grow plants, um, you know, they need, they need some sort of medium to, to be in. And some plants are perfectly fine growing in gravel, like these terrestrial vegetables. And then, you know, in the, in the troughs, it's just a flooded sort of pond-like environment. So we had to go with plants that are, are used to being in a submersed, flooded ah, environment. Okay. So okay. Um, what we're doing is we're experimenting with different crops to see what does well in this greenhouse, in this really nutrient-dense mm -hmm. water. One crop that we're seeing great promise is watercress. I was just saying, this looked like watercress. Yeah, here, yeah. try it. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, mm, nice, yeah. So, I mean. That's great. It's great because it's taking up the nutrients from the plants. This could be a high value market crop right here. I mean. You got a gourmet, a gourmet green. Totally, gourmet green right here. Um, this next plant here is actually a native that was a really important food crop to um, the, uh, the Native Americans of this region and it's called wapato. Wapato. Yeah, it's got an edible root or corn uh -huh, down uh -huh. under there, and they would roast it in pits and then eat the root. Very nutritious, very actually tasty. I've never had one, but um, you're gonna get to. I'm gonna get to, and yeah. here's the flower. Pretty, pretty flowers. So too. you would see this all around Oregon uh, in in wetlands, marshes, and ponds. Um, and then the next plant that we have down here, this sort of reed-looking plant. We go through the jungle to get this to it. This is great. I feel like I, you know, we're in the Amazon here. I love it. So this is um, hmm. this is actually a water chestnut. Really? Yeah, like the like you'd get in a in Asian foods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we went to the Asian food market and we got some water chestnuts, some fresh water chestnut, and we just put them in some gravel in this Serious? tray. Serious? And they're growing. I can't. So, I love it. I mean, yeah. I love water chestnuts anyway. They were a nice crunch. Yep. And what will happen is the plant will send out these runners here, and then. The runners will start new water chestnut plants, which will grow into water chestnuts. So it sounds like all three of these plants that you have as your start on, on water-based plants um, are, are happy. Yeah, these are basically the three that are left of the seven or eight that we started with. Okay. Um, some did better than others, and, and what, we're fi what we'll see is that next year, I mean, water chestnut could be a huge gourmet crop in this environment. So we're looking for ways that that we can feed ourselves with the tilapia and, and the vegetables yeah. and stuff, yeah. as well as have enough fish and produce that we can sell to supplement uh, yeah. Aprovecha's income, as well as pay for the cost of running the system. This is this is brilliant. I am really this is this is exciting. I'm looking forward to coming back and seeing in five years what what is how's this grown. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to, the recirculating aquaculture too is 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 a pretty fast growing sector of the mm -hmm. agriculture economy. Um, Aquaculture is huge. I mean, farm-raised fish, you go to the grocery store, yeah. you know, that's yeah. pretty much what you're seeing these days. And with fisheries in decline, um, these are the type of systems, and because they're recirculating, they're very sustainable. Right. Uh, conventional yeah. aquaculture uses a ton of fresh water, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. there's just a ton of wastewater coming out of it. Something like a million gallons per acre per year for conventional aquaculture. Wow. Where this is only losing water to evaporation and transpiration from the plants. So maybe a couple hundred gallons, you know, maybe a thousand gallons a year. Wow, yeah. big difference. Big difference, very right. sustainable. You know, the future of farming, and you can grow mm. vegetables, mm. you can grow fish, and the, the, the part that's most exciting to me about it is that you don't actually need agricultural land to do this. Um, we could be in a parking lot right. in the middle of, of New York City. Of course, In a of greenhouse. Course. Fabulous, oh, that's exciting. Thank you, this yeah. has been, this, uh, this has been a wonderful tour. Yeah. You're welcome. We're with Jeremy Roth, who's uh, coordinating the aquaculture project at Aprovecho. Thanks for joining me. Thank you.